Hello again, my friends. This is Kanita, and I greet you warmly. Warmly in the name of our risen Lord, Yeshua, Almighty God, on this cold and blustery, windy early Monday afternoon. Man, the weather sure changed in a hurry. It was like early summer almost. And then all of a sudden, the front came by, and the temperature dropped down into the 30s. We're in the 40s right now, and we got a wind coming out of the north at about 40 miles an hour, so you may hear some gusting around the trailer here and as it gently sways back and forth in the wind <laughs> you get used to that sort of thing you know but it does seem that we got the better end of the deal about 200 miles to the east of me they're getting a foot of snow and so uh, I certainly don't need that at this point in the year you know my friends every believer every one of us is burdened with a daily conflict, sometimes even an hourly struggle. This continual warfare is between our fallen nature with its corrupt body and the holy and divine nature of God, which is imparted to all of us with the coming of the Holy Spirit. The good news, if you want to call it that, is that this struggle lasts during the whole of our lives upon earth. And the even better news is that it increases in intensity as we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord. This internal warfare is pretty much experienced by all God's family. We all know what a burden it is to have this daily conflict within our bodies of sin. It is the greatest burden that most of us will ever have on earth. Now I know we all have our trials and many of them are heavy trials indeed but of all the burdens that I'm aware of this daily conflict with the workings of my corrupt heart my fallen and depraved nature that's constantly flaring up perpetually lusting with the eye catching my affections ensnaring my tongue and drawing me in this unrelenting fight forms the heaviest and seemingly the most consistent burden I have to carry. The conflict I daily and sometimes hourly feel within my own heart and soul has been my trouble and grief almost continually since my walk with our Lord began so many years ago. Oh, to be baffled as we are hourly baffled in our attempts to do good to find the carnality of our hearts perpetually obstructing every desire that rises in our bosom to be heavenly minded and to live in his honor and glory. To have this tide of carnality and pollution perpetually bearing down every spiritual desire in our hearts cannot help but bring down the soul which covets nothing, nothing so much as simply to walk in God's presence in his favor. And that this conflict should be a perpetual and unceasing one. That we should have so little respite from it that it should be not merely every now and then but more or less continuous always going on in our soul. How can this not cast down the soul which is the subject of it. I know with me, it casts me down day after day and sometimes hour after hour this unceasing and perpetual war that goes on within me. Between that which is spiritual, heavenly and holy and all that I adore and that which is earthly, carnal and sensual and all that I dis dislike and disgust. But I'm not alone and neither are you in these struggles. Listen to the words of Paul as he talks about this very same problem in the book of Romans. I know that no good lives within me, that is, in my human nature, for even though I desire to do good, even though the desire to do good is in me, I am not able to do it. I don't do the good I want to do, instead I do the evil that I do not want to do. 
If I do what I don't want to do, this means that I am no longer the one who does it. Instead, it is the sin that lives within me. So I find that this law is at work in me. When I want to do what is good, what is evil is the only choice I make. My inner being delights in the law of God. But I see a different law at work in my body. A law that fights against the law which my mind approves of. It makes me a prisoner to the law of sin which is at work in my body. What an unhappy man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is taking me to death? Oh, thanks be to God. Who does this through our Lord Jesus Christ? This then is my condition on my own. I can serve God's law only with my mind and my heart. While my human nature and the rest of my body serves the law of sin. Does this not describe all of us, my friends? And listen to the words of our Lord in the book of John. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's a stern reinforcement of what Paul has to say. For the truth is, my friends, there is no promise made that in this life we shall be set free from the indwelling and corruption of sin. Many think that their flesh is to become progressively holier and holier, that sin after sin is to be removed gradually out of their heart until at last they are almost made perfect in the flesh. But this is unsupported in Scripture, my friends. This is an idle dream bordering, bordering almost on foolishness and one which sooner or later will smash itself to pieces in the midst of a broken life. The flesh, alas, the flesh will ever remain the same. And we shall forever find that the flesh will lust and war against the spirit. It is the nature of who we are. Our fleshly nature is corrupt to the very core. It cannot and will not be mended. It is the same at the last as it was at the first, inherently evil. As such, and as such will never cease to be corrupt until we put off mortality totally and with it this body of sin and death. All of us, my friends, all of us are at best broken reeds filled with only smoking flax until, until his spirit comes upon and within us to stir the embers into the holy fires of his love. But the reed the reed shall, be, shall remain broken, that in its weakness it will learn to live in his strength and his grace. That is exactly what Paul is teaching in Romans 7, that this evil, fleshy nature may be subdued, kept down, mortified, crucified, and held under subjection by the power of grace. But as to any any permanent change passing upon the flesh or taking the place of the flesh so as to make it holy. This, this is but a delusion which promising a holiness in the flesh leaves us leaves us at last still under the power of sin. You see, herein is manifested the love and mercy of our slain and risen Redeemer that he will not quench the smoking fox, but will keep the flame alive which he himself kindled. The hand that brought the spark, the spark must and will keep the flame alive. For no man can quicken and no man can keep alive his own soul. How our souls are kept alive through all this struggle and turmoil is strictly through the mercies and mysteries of Almighty God. But for sure, kept alive it is. Often, my friends, when these burdens are at their heaviest, it can seem as though you have no life of God at all in your broken soul and barely a spark of grace in your withered heart. Where is your faith, your hope, and your love? Where is your spirituality and tenderness of heart? Where 
are your breathings and longings after God? Do they not all seem gone, pressed down, washed away? And for sure, all would be utterly and irretrievably gone if it were in our own hands or given to our own keeping. But it is, it is in far better hands and much better keeping than ours, my friends. Christ's sheep shall never perish, and none shall pluck them out of his hand. And in his hands, the smoking flax is never, never quenched. Again and again, this body of sin pours forth a whole flood of corruption to overcome and extinguish the life of God in our soul. The world without and the hidden world within would easily overcome and ingest us into their life of destruction and perdition were the Lord ever to release his protecting hand. Yet it is the Lord who keeps alive the holy flame which he himself has kindled. The blood which cleanses from all sin never was and never could be shed in vain. Though the flax smokes, my friends, it will never, never be extinguished where there is the life of God within. As it is written, when I am weak, then I am strong. A child of God in himself is all weakness. Others often boast of their strength, but he has none, and he knows he has none. We have all come to know the reality of this truth through the teaching of the Spirit and the experiences of our walk with him. You see, my friends, it is this weakness, known and felt deep within our own soul, this very weakness that opens the way for a personal experience of the strength of Christ. When Paul was groaning under the buffetings of Satan and the festering throbs of his thorn in the flesh, the Lord himself said to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. If, therefore, we do not know and acknowledge our weakness, oh, my friends, if it is not right in front of us, before our very eyes, we can never know what it is to have the strength of Christ made perfect within that weakness. Amen. Here then, here then is a bruised reed, a Lamb of God, ready to give up all hope, seemingly about to sink beneath the waves of his own flesh, no more to rise, expecting that the next blow will sever the stem or suffocate and bury him in his own mire and mud. But oh, how graciously, graciously and differently does our Redeemer deal with the tried and buried, burdened believer. <laughs> burdened. He deals with us, my friends, not according to our merits or our fears, our fears, but always, always according to his mercy and his love, raising up our drooping heads, careful not to break or to suffocate, but always to lift and refresh. You may perhaps feel yourself a poor bruised reed, bruised, bruised and barely hanging on by afflictions, by temptations, by guilt, by Satan, almost ready to perish, ready to give up all hope and just droop away and die. Oh, my friends, to all of us who look only unto him, our risen Lord and Master, we who are burdened in our conscience, troubled in our own mind, and distressed in our souls, hear his words, my friends. He calls out across the ages, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavenly burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. The reality is, 
if it isn't him? Where else can we go? The law? That only curses us. The world of men? They hate us. Into our own righteousness? Ha <laughs> ha! That is as filthy rags. And into our own strength. We have none. The truth is, my friends, we have no refuge but Jesus to take our burden of guilt and shame and to strengthen us to carry forth his light in spite of our own weakness and corruption. Oh, my friends, my burdened, heavily burdened friends, here is our only answer. Plunge into his fathomless, boundless ocean of love. It will cover all your sins. It will efface all your guilt. It will flood over all your unworthiness and carry away all your burdens on its golden waves of mercy as it gently lifts you to the shores of his eternal wholeness. Amen. Praise Almighty God. I guess I'm going to end here with a quote that I took out of some books that I was reading from a man named J.C. Philpott some 250 years ago as he struggled and helped others who struggled with this same burden. When we look upon ourselves, we often see ourselves the most stupid, the most ignorant, the most vile, the most unworthy, the most earthly and sensual wretches that God can permit to live. At least, that is the view we take of ourselves when we are really humbled, humbled in our own eyes and humbled before God. But when God looks upon his elect, he doesn't look, does not look upon them as they often look upon themselves. But he looks upon them as they stand in Christ, accepted in the beloved, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He does not see his people as they often see himself, see themselves, full of wounds, bruises and sores. But he sees us clothed in the perfection, beauty, and loveliness of our risen Lord and eternal husband. Amen, my friends. I know very little that I could add to that. It is another witness that the problems we see, the warfare we have within us, this struggle that seems continuous, is a part of the plan of God. For you see, life to bear fruit needs opposition. And it takes struggle, true struggle, to produce righteousness, my friends. Oh, Father, we thy children are often troubled in mind hearing within us at once the affirmations of our faith and the accusations of our conscience. We are sure that there is in us nothing that could attract the love of one as holy and just as you. Yet you have declared your unchanging love for us in Christ Jesus, our Savior, our risen Lord. Thy love is undeserved. You are in yourself the reason for the love wherein we are loved. Help us to know and believe the intensity and the eternity of the love you have for us, Father. Then your love will cast out fear and our troubled hearts will be at peace, trusting not in ourselves, but in what you have promised and declared. It is a good thing, Father, to give thanks unto you and to sing praises unto your name, to show forth your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. 
as our Lord, while he was on earth, was loyal to thee. So now in heaven he is faithful even unto us. And in this knowledge of his love and his faithfulness, and in his love, we now press on with all hope and all faith. In his name. Amen. As always, my friends, go in the strength and the power and the love of Almighty God, that His strength and power and love might always go and shine forth in you. Until the next time, have a wonderful day in the Lord. Goodbye. <laughs>